Uh, hello to those of you who are in, uh, um, what do you call it, Platinum, and uh, those who are watching online. My name's Warwick, and welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Can I just add one thing to Jamie's thing? The Go Team Variety Show next Saturday night, it is wet your pants funny. Like, you just got to come. I love it. Okay, that's all for me. Okay, good that you're here. I know that last Friday was Good Friday, but I just have to share this with you because it is, it's my favourite Good Friday cartoon because it explains why Good Friday is so good. Have a look at this. It's a BC cartoon. One caveman says to another, I hate the term Good Friday. And the other responds, why? The first response, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. And the second says, if you were going to be hanged on that day and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? And the reply is, good. <laughs> yeah. Have a nice day. It makes sense, doesn't it? Perfect explanation of why Good Friday is called Good Friday. Over the last couple of weeks in our Death of Death series, we've seen that Jesus has died in our place for our sin. He took the punishment that we deserve. He bore our shame. And through his death, we've been reconciled with God our Father. And over the last few weeks, we've also seen the overwhelming evidence that Jesus didn't just die, but also that he rose from the dead. Evidence that's contained in prophecies that were given over 800 years before Jesus was even born. Prophecies specifically about his death and his resurrection. We also saw the evidence from the Gospels, as well as evidence from the letters that the early Christians wrote to one another about their eyewitness accounts of the risen Jesus. And in those letters, we have copies of those letters from as little as 50 years after the events were written earlier than any other historical source from antiquity. And the number of copies that we have of those early documents simply overwhelms any suggestion that those documents have been changed over time. It's just not historically possible that the suggestion that they've been changed would hold any water. Objectively, we saw in the first week of our series that the evidence is clear. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, if you missed the evidence, head online to fellowshipdubai.com or check out the Fellowship app and have a look at that first sermon in the series and examine the evidence for yourself. Now, we haven't just looked at the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. We've also begun to look at some of the implications, one of which is this. If Jesus was raised then all of those who put their trust in him, their confidence in his death, will be reconciled to the Father. And not only that, but they too will be raised. That is, as a follower of Jesus, I believe that I'll be raised. If you're a follower of Jesus, you believe that you'll be raised. The question I want to ask is this, what will my body be like? Right? Will I get my hair back? Huh? Will my eyebrows start behaving? Do, do I get new knees? Will I finally get rid of those kilos that mysteriously arrived when I got to Dubai? What about the wrinkles, the stretch marks, the scars? If I'm going to have a body for eternity, if you're going to have a body to be for eternity, what's it going to be like? How about we pray and ask God to help us to understand this body that he's promised to give us at the resurrection? Would you pray with me? Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, as we look at your word this morning, help us to understand it. Open our eyes, unstop our ears, and change our hearts so that we can hear your word, trust it, and respond to it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the screen, you'll see an outline of where we're going this morning. And as we, uh, we think through what the Bible has to say about our resurrection bodies, as we've done all the way through the Death of Death series, we're focusing on just one chapter in the Bible. It's in a letter that one of the early Christian leaders wrote to a group of his friends in the Greek city of Corinth. 
He wrote to them about the resurrection and he spoke about his own encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And in this one chapter, Paul answers our question, what will our bodies be like? But before we hear from Paul, let me have just a quick word about Paul's answer to their question. Because they say, you know, what will his body be like? But their question that they asked Paul was actually mocking Paul's belief. He was mocking their, they were rather mocking his confidence that we would be raised. But instead of being phased by their mockery, Paul simply took them on and answered their question. And he did it, first of all, by appealing to something that anyone who has ever had a veggie patch would be familiar with. That is, planting a seed and a week or so later seeing green shoots come out of the ground. He explains that in the natural world as well, God has made all different types of beings, of bodies, of organisms, and they're all unique. He then applies the gardening illustration to our natural bodies, which will one day be buried like a seed in the ground, which helps us to understand that our resurrection bodies, when they come out of the ground, like the shoots of a new green plant, will look quite different to what went in. We're planted as natural bodies. We're going to be raised something quite different. Let's have a listen. I'm going to read to you uh, Paul's... Uh, letter 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 49. Have a listen, have a look, and let's see if we can't make some sense of it. Let me just do that. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of bodies will we come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life again unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but a mere kernel of of wheat or some other grain. But God gives to each one a body as he chooses. For each type of grain, there's a different kind of body. For not all flesh is the same. There's one kind of flesh for humans. There's a different kind for animals. There's a different kind for birds. And a different kind for fish. And then there are heavenly bodies. And there are earthly bodies. And the glory of the heavenly is of one kind. And the glory of the earthly is another. And there's one glory for the sun and a different glory for the moon, and a different glory for the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonour. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Now, if there is a natural body, then then there's also a spiritual body because it's written... The first man, Adam, he became a living being. The last Adam, he became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that's first. It's the natural that's first and then the spiritual body. So the first Adam was from the earth. A man of dust. The second man was from heaven. And as is the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And and just as we've borne the image of the man of flesh, 
so we shall also bear the image of the man who is of heaven. Okay, that's the, that's the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. We're at point two on the outline. B, let's have a think about farming and flesh. As the passage opens, he makes two very clear points, and they're very simple. His first one is this, verse 36. What you sow does not come to life again unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. In other words, no one in their right mind puts a seed in the ground and expects a seed to come back up. You plop a seed in the ground and we all know you expect to see a plant come back. In other words, what goes into the ground is different from what comes out of the ground. And secondly, every farmer knows, as does anyone else who opens their eyes, verse 39, that not all flesh is the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. And he goes on to point out that throughout the whole of creation, both here on earth and in the celestial realm, there are different kinds of bodies. So one, what goes in is different from what comes out. And two, not all bodies are the same. In fact, we know that there are a myriad of different kinds of bodies. And it's at this point that he takes those two points and applies them to our resurrection bodies as he begins to show us the difference between the body that is put in the ground in burial and the body that Jesus will raise from the dead, between the natural body we have in this life and the spiritual body that is to come. Let's compare the pair. So verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. In other words, let me show you the parallels between what we see in our world and our resurrection bodies. His first point is, well, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. And there's a significant difference, isn't there, between those two. This body, it dies. That body will never die. I discovered a very depressing number just the other day. It's called your maximum heart rate. How many of you know about maximum heart rate? Quick show of hands. Okay, you're already depressed. Uh, and the others, you're about to join us in our depression. Okay, the basic way to calculate your maximum heart rate, have a look at it on the screen, is to subtract your age from 220. So if you're 45, 220 minus 45, you get a maximum heart rate of 175. And the maximum heart rate is the maximum number of times your heart should beat during exercise. Me? I'm 55. My maximum heart rate is 165. Here's the depressing bit. In 10 years, it'll be 155. In 20 years, it'll be 145. It only gets worse. I played squash last week with my son. His maximum heart rate is 195. Hmm. We've both got smart watches. Uh, When we compared our heart rates afterwards, um, mine was maxed out the whole time we were playing. His was lounging around 135. Hmm. This body is perishing before my eyes. It's not just that the hair's gone and the eyebrows arrived. The knees aren't the same. The back is dodgy. The Achilles is playing up. I'm not as flexible as I used to be. We can all dye our hair, get Botox fillers, exercise within an inch of our lives. But if you want to know somebody's age, just take a look at their hands. right? Because you can't hide your age with your hands. right? Your hands are a constant reminder that you're perishing. And if the person next to you has just looked at their hands or hidden them, you know that they're worried. (laughs) Whether it's the hands or the maximum heart rate, with this body, you and I, we are all on a slippery slope into the grave. It doesn't matter what you do. This body is perishing. It's like the milk in the fridge. It has an expiry date. It will die. But our resurrection bodies are imperishable. They will never die. 
That's not all. Verse 43. It's sown in dishonour. It's raised in glory. I I don't know the last time you had the the privilege of visiting somebody who was living in a hospice or, or a nursing home or when you had one of your elderly family members living with you. You're watching them shuffling about with a frame. It's a far cry from their glory days. There's nothing glorious about watching a body racked with cancer struggling to breathe. There's nothing glorious about the late stages of diabetes destroying once strong flesh. And let's be honest. No one calls their 50s, 60s, 70s or 80s their glory days. This body of mine is not becoming more glorious. It is decaying. But the body that is raised will be glorious forever. It will be imperishably glorious. That's not all. Verse 43 again. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Recently, I had my folks staying and my son was with us for the five days over Easter. And the contrast between my dad at 85, me at 55 and my son at 25 is stark. My dad's 85. He struggles to get out of a lounge chair without significant effort. When my son Tom arrived, I just loved wrapping my arms around him and feeling his strength. Watching Tom ride around, sorry, glide around the squash court uh, the other day, he's fit, he's strong, he's athletic, he's nimble, he's way too fast. <laughs> the contrast could not be starker. And yet, Tom will age. He's 25, it's all downhill from here for him. Right? I hope. No, no. He's peaking at 25. He'll be 55 before he knows it. And like my dad, he'll be 85 before he's ready. The power we have in our natural bodies, it's fleeting. It just doesn't last. But our resurrection bodies, they will have an imperishable power, a power that will never fade, will never peak, will never leave us. You see verse 44, what we put in the ground, what we bury in the cemetery, it's sown a natural body, perishable, dishonourable, weak. But what is raised is so much different. It's raised a spiritual body, imperishable, glorious and powerful. I don't know about you, but I want one of them. But the older I get, the more keenly my desire for my resurrection body grows. My mum has had, count them, three hip replacements. Not because she has three legs, but because when she was 77, she was snow skiing and fell and broke one of her first hip replacements. She's had two knees replaced. She's had an ankle reconstructed. She's had nine of her vertebrae fused. When she goes through the metal detector at the airport, it lights up like a Christmas tree. (laughs) My mum is in constant pain. But she's not bitter and she doesn't complain. Rather, she's waiting patiently. She's waiting patiently for her resurrection body. Her sure hope is that Jesus rose and that he will keep his promise and raise her with a resurrection body as well. She's looking forward to a body that is imperishable, glorious and powerful. So much more than her natural body could ever promise. Yes, There are tears for her. Yes, there is significant frustration. But yes, there is a deep longing. But it's not a longing to be back in her 20s. It's a longing for her new body to come. In many ways, 
I miss being 25. But in other ways, I don't. I miss my body not being at its peak. I miss that feeling of invincibility, of power and glory. But it's so deceptive. That 25-year-old body, it, it promises what a natural body can never deliver. And it distracts us from reality that this body really is perishable and dishonorable and weak. And you know, our memories of our 25-year-old self, they can mess with our heads. Those memories can have us longing to wind back the clock, trying to regain our youth, rather than looking forward with eager expectation. Expectation for the resurrection body, for the spiritual body to come. We can often waste so much time and energy and money and heartache desperately pretending that this body is not perishing, that we fail to understand how to live in this life with our eyes firmly fixed on the body that is to come, with that quiet confidence, that settled demeanour that we will be given a new body. That certainty shapes how we live. It moulds our decisions. It creates our dreams, our hopes and our longings. So let me ask you, as you think about this body, your body, are you looking back to a past that you will never regain, to a body that you will never know again? Or are you looking forward to a new body, a spiritual body, Are you looking forward to a body that leaves this one for dead? Now, I'm sure that some of you, like those reading Paul's letter, you're sitting here and actually doubting that there really is a spiritual body to come. We're at 2D on the outline. Look at verse 44. It's for you. Paul says, look, if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. His quote comes from Genesis chapter 2. And when I first read it, it had me completely flummoxed. The first man, Adam, became a living being. Genesis 2, yeah, I get that. The second part, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's Paul's words, and he puts them together. And I couldn't quite work out what he was on about. It was only when I went back to Genesis 2 and looked at it in its context that the penny dropped. It made sense. Let me show you. It's kind of cool. In Genesis 2, verses 5 to 7, the writer describes how God creates this natural body. And the first thing he does in verses 5 and 6 is he talks about the timing. When? Verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground and and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Notice verse 7. Then, then the creation of man. Then the Lord God formed the man. From where? Of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. The penny dropped for me when I remembered that the word for breath and the word for spirit is exactly the same in the original language. It's the word ruach. That is, you could easily say, and it's probably better to say, that God breathed the spirit of life into the man and he became a living creature. That's how we got this living body. I'm a scientist. I know that I could melt you down into your component chemicals and I could sell your body off for about 100 dirhams. Okay, that's all your body's actually worth. Okay? But God breathed his spirit into that collection of chemicals and Adam came to life. Paul's point is that Jesus has done exactly the same thing for us. God breathed his spirit into a lump of clay and it came to life as a man, Adam. And now the last man, Jesus, has become a life-giving spirit. He too breathes life into inanimate objects, our dead mortal bodies, and he raises them as he's been raised to be imperishable and glorious and powerful, to have spiritual bodies. By his spirit, 
He takes our natural body and gives us a spiritual body that is just like His, that comes not from the ground, but from heaven, which is where He's from. That's what Paul does in verses 40, uh, 47 to 49. He shows us that we get our natural bodies from Adam and our spiritual bodies from Jesus. Adam got his from the ground. Jesus' body came with him from heaven. As he has a heavenly body, that's exactly what we will get as well. Look at verse 47. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Heaven. Adam came from the ground, Jesus comes from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. Just as Adam came from the dust, so do we. And you know we're all going to end up there. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. If Jesus, who's come from heaven, has poured his spirit into our lives, we are with him. We are of heaven. He goes on, just as we've borne the image of the man of dust, just as we're like Adam, natural as he was, perishable, inglorious and weak, so too we will bear, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. Jesus will breathe his spirit into us and raise us from the dead. Just as God brought Adam to life, so too Jesus, who is from the Father, Jesus, who is God the Son, who has come from heaven in the form of a man, he has poured out His Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing our resurrection on the last day. We will have a heavenly body, just like His. I'm not looking forward to my earthly body continuing to decay. I'm not looking forward to the restrictions that it will continue to impose on me. I'm not looking forward to death, but I don't fear it. I'm not looking forward to ageing and all that goes with it, but I know they're coming and I'm expectant. But the promise of a new body, the certainty of the resurrection body that's going to be like Jesus' heavenly body, that is something that I am looking forward to. I'm looking forward to being imperishable and glorious and powerful, spiritual. What about you? As you live your life now, are you fooling yourself? Are you one of those lucky ones who's around 25 and you're currently living in your prime, but failing to see what is yet to come? Or if you're in your 20s, do you appreciate just the shortness of the season that you're now enjoying and you know that there's actually something better to come? Are you fooling yourself? Working hard to maintain a prime that is so quickly passing you by? Are you trying to stop the clock? Or are you using the certainty of the passing of your prime to help you reset your focus, fixing your eyes on the resurrection body that is to come and ensuring that you will be ready for it? Where do you stand? How do you think about your body? How do you think about the body to come? I don't know if you believe a single word of anything that I've said so far. I don't know if you've been dragged along by family and friends and you're kind of glad that we're at point three on the outline thinking there can't be much longer to go. I don't know if you believe anything that I've said or not. But as we finish, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. Everything rests on the resurrection. That is, if Jesus rose, then everything that I said is true. If Jesus didn't rise, everything that I've just said is utter rubbish. And there is no middle ground. There's no if it's true for you. Right? It's just rubbish. It's either factually true or it's a lie. If Jesus didn't rise, it is rubbish. And would someone please tell me so that I can go and get a decent job? <laughs> Paul knows it though too. Remember what we saw a couple of weeks earlier in this chapter. He writes, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. It's useless. 
we're even found to be misrepresenting God. We're saying things about God that are simply not true because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he didn't raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. We've got nothing. Not only that, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And then verse 19 is the icing on the cake. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We are the biggest bunch of losers that have ever walked the face of the planet. If you didn't rise, that's what we are. Losers. But if Jesus did rise, then his resurrection is our guarantee that we will be raised with spiritual bodies. And if Jesus did rise and you haven't put your trust in his death and resurrection, it's not me. I'm not the one with a lot to lose. It's you. I'm not the loser. But if Jesus rose and you haven't placed your trust in him, you stand to lose everything for eternity. That's pretty sobering. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, let me ask you two questions. The first question is this. How certain are you that Jesus didn't rise? How certain are you that you've actually got the facts right? Because you're basing your eternity on the belief that Jesus didn't rise. That's question number one. How certain are you? Second question, where's your evidence? What's the evidence that you're trusting for the view that you hold? Because I've laid out a whole stack of evidence over the last few weeks that Jesus rose. Historical evidence, verifiable evidence. Where's yours? If Jesus rose, we will be raised and you won't. You will lose everything. If Jesus didn't rise, I'm a loser. One of us loses. Who's it going to be? And how sure are you and why? To help you think through the new, that, that question, one of the things we've been encouraging you to do over the last couple of weeks is have a look at the 2017 film called The Case for Christ. It's about Lee Strobel, who's a, 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 a journalist in the States whose wife became a believer. He was an atheist. And he set about trying to prove that she was a nutter for believing in the resurrection. And what he did was he explored all of the evidence. And as he looked at all of the evidence, he discovered that Jesus really did rise. Invest two hours of your life this weekend. Have a look at the evidence afresh and ask yourself, what evidence do I have that Jesus rose or didn't rise? Base your decision on facts, not on feelings. Ask yourself, how sure am I that I'm right? Does my life line up with the facts or are the facts an inconvenience? Me? I've had a good hard look at the facts. I'm convinced. And as I age, I'm more and more looking forward to the resurrection body that's to come. And I would love you to join me in that. I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the great promise that you will raise us on the last day with the Lord Jesus and give us bodies that are so much better than the ones we have now. Father, we look forward to that resurrection body, glorious and powerful and imperishable. Father, we look forward to it. Help us to live in the light of its certainty. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name and for your glory's sake. Amen.